Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that can spot a POS a mile away, even with beer goggles on. He is the captain. I detect it with my sniffer. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. We are sipping on haze from Treehouse Brewing Garage Grade 5 out of 5 bottle caps. Haze is a double IPA with peach, orange, and passion fruit. This is a juice bomb of a beer with pleasant, saturated hop oil finishes. And this week's beer was brought to us by our good friends. First up, let me cheers Megan in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I bet uh, Adam Carolla would love this beer because it has passion fruit next up we have lynn bin in hollywood florida a big cheers to lisa in atlanta and here's a toast to jade delivering the mail in australia we want to give a big thank you to tina tina says love you guys and the captain is the man and Mm. last but not least we have a big big thank you to paula it doesn't say where paula is from but she is certainly welcome to parts unknown whenever she pleases so paula thank you very much and thanks to everyone who helped out with this week's beer fund. Yeah, and if you'd like to help us out, go to the website and click on the donate banner. That's at truecrimegarage.com. While you're there, check out the store page. We got beer koozies. We got t-shirts. We got all kinds of fun garage stuff there for you. Yeah, get your koozie. And that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. So where are Shanann, Bella, and Cece? Now, Nicole Kissinger, Chris's mistress, only confirmed to police what they already suspected, that Chris Watts was a liar, a cheater, and likely disposed of his family to get rid of the inconvenience of being a husband and father. Chris agreed to take a polygraph test. The results of the exam stated deception indicated. Chris Watts was lying. The detectives in the room decided to go for broke. They told Chris that he failed. They knew he was lying and it was time to come clean. Then they pulled out a photo of his family. This is when Chris confessed, but not to murder. He told investigators that he was being untruthful and he hurt Shanann emotionally. Mm -hmm. He told them he was having an affair for five or six weeks He told them he never felt about anyone the way he felt about, quote, her. He didn't want to tell the cops his lover's name. Right. He wanted to keep her name out of it. Of course, the cops had already talked to Nicole at length. Chris went on to say that his and Shanann's life was totally focused on the kids, and he didn't feel as though he could be himself or the person that he really was or who his wife needed him to be because he walked on eggshells around her. The investigators kept pushing Chris and they kept hoping that somewhere he has a conscience. Well, they keep telling him, Hey dummy, you, you failed the test, right? Mm-hmm. We, we asked you three questions and those three questions, Chris, did we ask you about an affair? Did we ask you about your girlfriend? No. So you failed the test. And for whatever reason, Chris is like trying to get them to convince. Well, it's because I was holding that back Mm -hmm. that that's why I, I didn't pass the test, but trust me. Yes. Did I hurt her emotionally? Yes. But I did not, I did not hurt her physically, but he also states that at some point, maybe that his wife, that he told his wife about the affair and that that's why she ran off Mm -hmm. or some crazy nonsense like that. Well, when he doesn't cave what the interrogators do, they try a new tactic. And one of them asked Chris, whether maybe Shanann had quote done something to the girls. Right. One of the detectives even tells Chris that he worked a case where the mother smothered her two kids because she didn't want her husband to be able to take them away from her. Mm -hmm. And after first denying it, it seems likely that this concept gives Chris an idea. Because Chris asked to take a break and to talk to his father, who was waiting outside. Now, his father, Ronnie, comes in, 
And the detectives remind Chris that whatever they say will be recorded. And then they leave. And Chris says to his dad in a quiet, broken voice that he doesn't want to protect Shanann. He tells Ronnie that after he left their conversation about separating and went downstairs, he came back up to the master bedroom for something and saw on the baby monitor that Bella was splayed out on her bed. The monitor flipped to Cece's room and Chris says he saw Shanann sitting on top of Cece strangling her. He ran into the room and attacked Shanann and quote, did the same thing to her. He says it was over fast. He had a lot of rage and Shanann wasn't able to fight back. Right. He guessed that Shanann must have just lost it. He put Shanann's body back on the master bed and covered her up because he said he couldn't look at her and he felt horrible for what he did. Then he said he looked at his kids and saw what she did. Now, Ronnie is aghast at this news, obviously. He says, my godson, and puts his hand on Chris's arm. Right. Chris says he could tell the girls were dead because they were both blue. He did not attempt CPR. He did not call 911. Instead, he put the bodies behind the driver's seat. This is in the second row of his truck Mm -hmm. and disposed of them. So Chris puts the blame on Shanann for killing the girls. He says, quote, emotionally, he must have drove her to do something stupid. He claims that she had had a temper and would fly off the handle. He implies that she was unstable. Now, we know, Captain, that the police already knew where the bodies were. In fact, they were on site when one of them received a call that Chris confessed. Mm-hmm. Of course, this is at the site that we already discussed, site number 319, where Chris went on August 13th. What is incredible is how little time he actually had there and how risky his dumping of the bodies was. We know that he arrived on site at 6.53 a.m. Other employees reported arriving before 7.30. Chris had been texting them and calling them starting at 6.29 a.m. to find out what time they would arrive. It was broad daylight. This gives Chris maybe 30 minutes to hide three corpses. So how did he do it? The answer is very quickly and very sloppy. Now the two 400 barrel tanks on the site contained crude oil. This is a toxic chemical that exudes strong fumes. Chris was an operator and was intimately familiar with these storage tanks and how they worked. The two tanks were next to each other and accessible from the top by climbing a narrow metal staircase up the side of the tanks. Each tank had one eight inch wide thief hatch. That's what they call them on top. And it was into these two tanks that Chris dumped the bodies of his baby girls. He shoved three year old Cece, still wearing her pink nighty and pull up diaper into the hatch of one of the tanks, leaving a clump of hair on the hatch. He shoved four year old Bella and her unicorn nightgown into the other. Bella's body had scratches on it from the hatch. Chris said he could tell how much oil was in the tanks by the sound of the splashes the girls' bodies made. When investigators asked whether there was any way that the girls were still alive when they hit the oil, he said, No, 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 God, no. Mm-hmm. Now, Chris knew he couldn't fit Shanann's body into this little opening on the tank. So he dug a hole in the ground near the tanks and he shoved his dead wife's body into a fetal position into about 27 inches deep into a hole and covered her up with just three inches of dirt. Meanwhile, investigators at the site used a drone to do a flyover to get the lay of the land. And the drone camera showed them what appeared to be a sheet in the brush and a freshly disturbed patch of dirt there. They found a broken rake, two black trash bags and the fitted sheet matching the missing one from the Watts bedroom. Right. The sheet had clearly been used to drag a body as it was covered with dirty drag marks and then dumped into the brush in haste. Coroners were called in and sure enough, Shanann was unearthed from the shallow grave. We know that law enforcement knew the site, the location, and then at some point they actually hold up a picture of the location of, because they say, hey, we've been there earlier. Mm-hmm. We Here's some drone footage. And by the way, here's an overview. Where is 
your wife's body. Right. And he, and he points them out to him. But you have to know that the law enforcement, that the, the agent that said, hey, I once worked a case where the, the mother smothered the children, and then that's the excuse he's using, mm-hmm. you, you know that the agent's going, this is just bullshit. Yeah. Well, and I mean, he's placed under arrest for the murder of his wife on that night. Right. And this is after what we should refer to as his partial confession. Right. And there is probably absolutely no doubt in any of the investigators' minds at this point that Chris Watts was 100% guilty of killing his entire family. Yeah. After all, his behavior was suspicious from the beginning. He left a, a trail of evidence and he lied to police. All right, so when does the confession part two take place? Well, that's what's interesting here, because this is not a whodunit. You know, we all know that Chris Watts, seemingly a loving father and adoring husband, was actually a murderer. Right. The, the question in this case is, how much of a monster is he? Yeah, did he, how and why? Yeah, did he just snap and kill Shanann in retaliation for her murders of the girls as he has at times continued to claim or did he have some kind of mental break or as many believe and as he ultimately pled guilty to did he actually kill not only his pregnant wife and fetus but both his daughters as well and if so did he plan the whole event how much of his life was a lie and why would he do the unthinkable even if shenan drove him into a rage why did he kill his little girls as well. So first of all, the question about whether Chris or Shanann killed the girls, Chris claims that his wife lost it, killed the daughters after the separation discussion, right? But Mm -hmm. investigators are not going to buy this. For one thing, Bella and Cece were not strangled as he stated that he saw on the monitor. Right. And Chris's story, Shanann strangles them in a rage. But the autopsy reports in the death of both girls is very clear. They died of asphyxiation due to smothering. There were no finger or hand marks around the girls' necks whatsoever. Bella had struggled violently while she was being smothered. She bit through her tongue. Cece had no marks on her at all. So according to Chris... Well, she bit through her tongue, but she also didn't... She have separation... Of from her gums to her mouth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. On the uh, soft tissue inside the face there. Yeah. Um, Shanann could not have strangled either of them. You know, mm-hmm. Chris is lying about this, and that's clear from the autopsy. What is also totally and completely out of character for Shanann to have laid a finger on her girls. Right. You know, further, most women who kill their children have warning signs mm-hmm. such as depression, anxiety, and. It, the list goes on and on. Right. Shanann had none of these. Chris's story was a tale he invented in an attempt to save his own skin. He ended up pleading guilty to all three murders as well as unlawful termination of a pregnancy in a plea deal that saved him from the death penalty. To this day, his mother still alleges that Shanann was the baby killer. So now to our second question as to whether Chris Watts just snapped and killed his entire family in a rage, a blackout, or a break with reality, or did he plan to murder his family? Right. We may likely never know the answer to this for sure, unless he speaks up at some point. Uh, He has refused to address any of this, but most people seem to agree that, yes, the slaughter of the Watts family was premeditated. This includes the district attorney, who made the plea deal with Chris whereby he pled guilty to all three murders. He said that the evidence does not point to a crime of passion driven by blind rage. So what points to premeditation? First, on that Friday before the murders, the 10th, Chris took the day off so he could care for the girls while Shanann headed to Arizona. While he was meeting a co-worker, Troy McCoy, in a parking lot to exchange an Amazon Fire Stick McCoy received a call from a colleague named Cody Roberts indicating that there was a possible slow leak at the 319 site and asking if someone could head out there on Monday. Chris overheard McCoy's conversation with Roberts and he volunteered quickly that he could go out there and take care of it. He knew it was a one person job and that the other employees would not be present. Further, he then texts Cody Roberts on Sunday 
August 12th at 5.06 p.m. This is during a birthday party where he was at with his girls. This is to confirm that he would be heading out to the site on Monday morning, and then he would report back. He said no reason for the both of them to go. Roberts later remarked that it was unheard of for Chris to make contact on a weekend. Chris also later told Nicole in a two-hour phone call on the night of the 12th, during which Shanann was trying to call him from the airport, that he would not be into the office in the morning as usual. This would avoid him having to go into the office first, which is his usual MO, and would give him time alone at the very remote site. Another thing, Nicole Kissinger stated that on the rare occasions that the two went out in public, Chris always paid with cash or Anadarko gift cards. But on that Saturday night, August 11th, when Chris told Shanann he was at the Rockies game and he and Nicole actually went to the Lazy Dog, he casually charged dinner for two on Shanann's joint credit card. But if he's planning to murder her, and this is premeditated murder, he knows he's not going to have to answer for these charges or won't care that he did this. Well, he is also fine with racking up almost a half a million dollars in debt and file bankruptcy. The other thing too, and this is more speculation, you know, I know it's all speculation, but this seems a little more questionable. There's something that's been referred to as the creepy doll photo. This is a quite the weird one, but on August 9th, Chris texted his wife a photo of a three foot long human looking doll lying on the sofa in the house mm -hmm. covered with what looks like a white sheet. I guess it's actually a, a twister mat. Chris said that the girls did it when they were playing, but could this have been some kind of sick, you know, joke t t that only Chris would understand or some kind of weird warning? Um, this is, this image is one of the last to appear on Shanann's Facebook page. Well, and she actually replies, I don't know what to think about this. And then mm -hmm. it's the, the crying laughing emoji. Mm -hmm. So that's very strange. The final thing that points to premeditation is the manner of the killings. You know, remember the DA said that Chris had not killed in rage as he claimed. This is because the evidence shows that the two girls were smothered mm -hmm. separately one at a time, which takes patience and perseverance. Experts say it takes three to four minutes to kill someone in this manner. And Chris, as we know, made sure that they were really dead, smothering the girls until they were blue. He wasn't rushing around bashing people over the head or stabbing them. The The girls had no marks on their bodies, you know, practically anywhere. And as for Shanann, she had no bruises, marks, or wounds on her body. The characteristic of a rage attack. Right. She was systematically and deliberately strangled to death with the only marks left behind being finger marks on her throat. We don't know where shenan was killed the the sofa in the loft or in the bedroom but i believe it was upstairs as the motion detectors in the home show no motion in the house until 4 23 a.m when we know chris was waking up to make his thrive shake and packing his lunch for the day we don't know exactly how she was killed you know was she attacked from behind or while she slept but remember there were no defensive wounds right we don't even know for sure the order of the killings. No. Were the girls killed before Shanann arrived home? I, I, I think that this might be unlikely, Captain, as there's a chance that Shanann may have noticed that they were dead. But per, perhaps, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's tough to figure out what was going in that home. I, mean, I was actually speculating that he did it. He actually killed his daughters first. And maybe. And then waited for her kept them in their rooms or, or tucked away somewhere. Yeah. Because she gets home around two. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about, it's only a couple hours, mm -hmm. a few hours before he leaves to put them in their resting spots. You know, what's the, what's weird here too, amongst all this other chaos. Um, there were some of his friends that came forward to state that it, it may have been a rage because they felt that Chris was smart and that if he planned the whole thing, he likely would have never got caught. Yeah, but just because you wear glasses doesn't make you smart. 
I mean, a lot of people assume people are. Look, I think the fact that he's telling his work, hey, I'm not going to be in tomorrow. I'm going to go to the job site first. And that site was the, the resting spot. Mm-hmm. To me, that's that kind of shows the whole plan laid well, out. Like, yeah. Not just like, well, I, I, I figured out how to dump them later because I knew I was going there anyway, so I should just dump them there. Right. But to me, that's very calculated. So that's where I I lean towards the fact that he he killed his daughters first because, hey, I got to get this done, and then she gets home, and then I got to kill her, and then I got to get them all ready to get them out to this job site. Right. And I think you're right. I think the, the taking on that job at the last minute and really pushing that he be the only one at that job site that points the most to me as premeditation. The thing I think here, regardless of how smart some of his friends may think he is, and if he were capable of getting away with it, because it looks to me like his plan was to dispose of their bodies there. And then it's after work, go home, clean up the house, remove Shanann's belongings, and probably some of the children's belongings. He's likely going to want to make it look like they were either taken from some, you know, by someone or that they left on their own. Mm-hmm. And his, his whole alibi is, well, I was gone at work the whole day while they either took off on their own or somebody got to him. Right. What he didn't plan for was her friend being so concerned that she dropped by the house. And as you said, she, gut feeling, raise the alarm. Mm-hmm. you know, and called police, stopped by the doctor's office to see that she had not, in fact, shown up for her 10 o'clock appointment. All right, we're back. Cheers, Nate. Cheers, Captain. The other thing we got to call in a question here is motive or how much of a motive there was for these murders. Why did it happen at all? I mean, we know the obvious reasons, right? Right. The affair, maybe wanting out of his marriage. Uh, But was there also a financial motive? You know, you talked about some of the problems they were having. Yeah. And in fact, Nicole Kessinger told police that Chris was very stressed out about money. Now, we know that Shanann handled the finances. But there were definitely financial issues. Well, that's what he said. Yeah, that's what he says. Right. Uh, we know that there were financial issues going on. In mm. fact, finances were the one thing that anyone who knew the couple well said that they argued about. Now, the Watts's filed for bankruptcy in 2015. They were $448,000 in debt. Chris had to sell his car. Since the bankruptcy case closed in October of 2015, they got themselves into financial trouble again. At the time of Shanann's <sighs> death. This is so ridiculous because, first of all, the fact the fact that we live in a country that you can rack up almost $500,000 worth of debt, uh, that, that will be wiped clean. Yeah, you're going to lose a couple of your items, but there's a $400,000 house that you live in that they didn't take away, that they still got to live in. I mean, it's just, that's ridiculous to me. Well, at the time of, of her death, uh, at the time of, you know, this murder, their credit cards were pretty much maxed out, you know, with, with 8,000 to $10,000 balances. Well, no shit. Because if you file bankruptcy and you didn't have to pay it back the first time, what makes you think that you're going to have to pay it back the second time? It turns out their largest creditors were Toys R Us and mm-hmm. Ford Motor Company. The mortgage on the $400,000 house was sizable with a monthly payment of 207, sorry, $2,700. Mm-hmm. Chris says Shanann wanted the house. He wanted to downsize. They hadn't paid their mortgage in three months and received a delinquency letter from Chase. Now, even though Shanann at some point took $10,000 out of Chris's 401k to pay mortgage payments. Right. Chris told Nicole the couple was, quote, house poor and that their lifestyle was not sustainable. Yeah. He had life insurance policies on both the girls for $25,000 each. And then on Shanann, 
uh, it looks like there was, I have a little question on what the amount was for Shanann, but I saw reports of as little as $50,000 all the way up to $100,000. Yeah. But still, that might not have been the motive as far as the insurance policy, right? Mm -hmm. Because maybe that gets you a little bit out of debt. But it's also, if he is telling the truth, which I don't believe him about shit really, but if he's saying, look, she controlled the finances and, and she pulled money and she charged things if she wanted to, his motive his motive could have just been to stop the financial bleeding and she's the one causing the financial bleeding in mm. his mind. Mm. Yeah, I mean, he would tell people that she was an overspender and he made references to her shopping habits saying that she, you know, she had to have everything that she saw and she needed to purchase a lot of things to look like the perfect family. Yeah, there's a lot of keeping up with the Joneses here and a lot of fake narrative. Well, and the girls went to a a private school, which was rather pricey. It was like $500 a week. And I think that was per child. And then we have a third child on the way. I guess there was a uh, expensive neck surgery, which was likely, I mean, necessary and needed. Possibly. Uh, for, but again, what what if there is some hint of like hypochondriac, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like this surgery that you don't really need, but you have convinced everybody else that you need it. Mm-hmm. And I know that seems extreme, but I've heard of cases, married couple, that the wife goes to Mexico to get stuff removed because they won't remove it in the States Hmm. because that's how delusional she got about her. She's a hypochondriac. Well, this surgery was for a compressed disc. Mm -hmm. It cost a hundred thousand dollars with their insurance and they owed $25,000 out of pocket. I'm sure, you know, some of this was covered somewhere along the way. We don't need to get too far into that, but they had outstanding student loans. I mean, it's just, it's it, it it's on and on and on and on and on. But either way, I mean, you're you're in a marriage that maybe you fall out of love. You're in a marriage that the person's spending a lot more money. You're not managing your money correctly. You already went bankrupt. This is no reason for murder. Well, of course. You know, you have a mistress. No reason for murder. There's no reason to take your chi- your children's life. Right. I mean, it's just, I understand his parents trying to find excuses and his parents trying to find something that makes sense. And it might be possible that he was under so much stress that he just snapped, but snapped for a period, not killed these people in rage but snapped in a period, and if I do this and I kill them, this will be all over with. Well, it is all over with. Well, and I mean, his mother, for the longest time, and I believe still to this day, you know, but for, regardless, but for the longest time, she was standing behind the idea that Shanann was responsible for the deaths of the two girls, right. and then Chris retaliated, that he, that he went and then killed her. Yeah. Now, I mean, obviously, there's no motive great enough. We're just exploring what these possibilities are because there are, you know, throughout history, and we've talked about several of them on this show, there are what law enforcement deem and title um, family annihilators. And Chris Watts, to me, fits this profile. Like a lot of the stuff going on in his world. Now, these are choices he made. This right. isn't, he's not a victim here. These, this isn't shit that just started happening to him. Mm. These are all choices he made as a grown man, but things going on in his no, he's world. Not a, he's not a man, Don't but, call him that. but you know what I mean? As a, yeah. whatever, but, but the things going on in his life at the time of these murders, it all seems to fit stories that we've heard before in similar yeah. situations with these family annihilators. I mean, very much so like the Scott Pearson case. Mm. I mean, so much so, and I, I don't know if I want to spoil this, but his we have the Google searches from the girlfriend, right, Nicole, and 
before she goes to the police, I think it's before she goes to the police, she Googles Scott Peterson. Yeah, yeah. And Scott Peterson's mistress. And then this this is this is eerie to me. Mm-hmm. And there's something really wrong here. And this makes me it makes me question even more. Mm-hmm. Because she Googles one, do people like Scott Pearson's mistress anymore? Do they hate her? Right? Right. But she oh, also Amber Fry, yeah. Amber so, Fry. Yeah, she <laughs> Yeah. And I'm sorry to laugh, but I thank God I'm able to because I this is a heavy case, man. A heavy, heavy case. And I'm I just needed that little that little sigh of relief there after some of the stuff that we've discussed here. Mm-hmm. But like you said, man, she is searching whether people still hated or whether people hated Amber Fry. Yeah, and I look, is that uh a, is that a reasonable thing to search? Yeah. Okay. I'll I'm gonna, give, I'll I'll give go it to that. you I'll because you're going to the cops, right? Mm-hmm. This is before you go to the cops and you go, I was with this married man. I knew it was wrong. Uh, I didn't think he was going to kill her. Mm-hmm. I didn't think he was going to kill his daughters. Mm-hmm. How cute is it now that he's a father? Right? Right. So she has to go to the cops. Is it that wrong that she searches that? Because if this hits the media like it already has, but if it blows up like the Chris, um, like the Scott Peterson case, are people going to hate me? Okay, mm-hmm. I'll give you that one. But when you Google how much Amber Fry got for her book deal. Oh, yeah, yeah. Use a giant flaming pile of shit. And, and, and then I think she did a big article in People Magazine. Oh, I didn't see that. How much she get paid for that one? Yeah, you giant piece of shit. Like, look, you should not be. A, OK, there's a crime here. Did you cause the crime now? Nah, but you're a part of it. Mm-hmm. And if you're a part of it, you shouldn't get paid for anything. That's the way it should work. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, they might have paid her a million dollars to do a story with People magazine. Do you deserve a million dollars? You giant pile of dog shit. No, you don't. You're a scumbag for sleeping with the married man. You're you're a scumbag once you find out that she's pregnant. I mean, the more and more she find out about it, at some point you should have cut this off. You're part of the problem. If if there's, a, like you said, if there is this new term, which eventually maybe we'll get to, maybe we'll have this thing where it's, you know, a guy gets himself into this situation, he be, he becomes a family annihilator new term. That's not a new term. No, what I'm saying is like, I mean, well, well, yeah, but you're identifying like a couple people. But what I'm saying is like, do they have like a clear def- definition of like what causes one of these individuals? Well, no, they just fall into a category. You know, you have right. serial murders, you have mass murders, you have family annihilators. Uh, the list goes on and on. Right. But what I'm saying is that, If you're the mistress, then you're, again, you're a part of the problem. And by being part of the problem, you shouldn't profit off this. Yeah. And where, I mean, where someone might be able to argue Google searching whether Amber Fry is a hated person or still hated person might look as maybe she could be another victim in this whole mess. But like you said, the, the checking out the, how much money did Amber Fry's book deal amount to is something completely different. No, yeah. and, and then look, on top of that, if you just look at the two cases, I mean, Amber Fry did not know. Scott Peterson was not married in her mind, was not told that he was married. Mm-hmm. This, you know, it's a whole different thing with Nicole. You work with this guy, you know he's married, he's telling you he's separated. Well, she attempted to delete every trace of her relationship with Chris from her phone before she went to police. And, Mm -hmm. you know, on Monday afternoon when she, you know, got word that Shannon and the girls were missing, she ran Google search for 
can cops trace text messages? And then another for how long do cell phone companies keep text messages? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, it's one of those things where part of me does feel bad for, her, but when you're searching that stuff, it's almost like, okay, well, I'm going to go to the cops. Hey, is there any way I can make a profit off this? Mm-hmm. Like, come on, be better than that. You're better than that. Well, on, on that night, Chris Watts brought his little girls home from a birthday party. They had pizza and candy and FaceTimed Chris's dad. Then Chris showered both girls, gave them a bedtime snack, and put them to bed. He was seen grilling alone in his backyard at around 7.15 p.m. He spoke with Nicole for two hours that night, ignoring calls from Shanann at the airport in Arizona, and then texted his wife at 11.21 p.m., holy crap, sorry I passed out on the couch. Shanann entered the home at 1.48 a.m., What exactly happened after that, we will likely never know. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that sometime between 1.48 a.m. and 5.27 a.m., by then all three were murdered by the man that was supposed to love them the most. Or protect them. Yes, or at least the, the man that they likely loved the most. On November 6th, 2018, three months after annihilating his family, Chris Watts pled guilty to nine felonies, three counts of first degree murder, two counts of murdering a child, one count of unlawful termination of a pregnancy, and three counts of tampering with a deceased human body. In court, he was forced to say guilty aloud nine times. Calling the crime the most inhumane and vicious he had ever seen in his career, the judge sentenced Chris Watts to five terms of life without parole. One again, the whole sentencing is on video. You can watch every second of it. Mm -hmm. Well, in a nice irony, uh, here's something that I found to be a little interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Chris Watts, who murdered his wife and children, And one of the reasons may have been because he was tired of being regimented and directed. You know, his whole life was documented on social media. His wife called the shots and his work documented every move he made in his vehicle. Well, he's now sitting in a prison being told what to do every minute of the day. And he'll never have to worry about money again. If that was one of the motives, right? Except that, he is being forced to pay restitution to his wife's family. So he will have to work that off in prison. And in Colorado, thanks to him, the proposed Nico's law will make killing an unborn baby a first degree murder. Yeah, it should be. And, but I've also heard a lot of rumors that it's not going to be nice for uh, Chris in prison. It's not going to be just sleeping in, having a good time. Cable TV. Having a good time. Well, I think. No, no, no. What, what I mean by that is like. Well, prison it, pri- justice. Prison sucks. But what I've heard is that um, they've had to take. They were taking precautions early on because when the prisoners found out where he was staying. They were getting excited. They want to get to him. Oh, yeah. Because not only. He's a marked man. Yeah. You killed these innocent children and you killed your unborn baby. Mm-hmm. I mean. You, you're you're beyond a piece of shit. I mean, ugh. well, I, I I hope him and Casey Anthony just burn in hell. Well, and I'd piss I'd piss on their graves. I'll tell you that. In a sick irony, Chris Watts has been receiving hundreds of letters from romantic admirers in prison. Those are those are a bunch of little pieces of shit. These are love letters and sexy photos sent to uh, an admitted family annihilator. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just soak that in. What kind of scumbag are you? Soak that in for a minute. Let me show you my titties, you scumbag. I mean, come on. They they shouldn't allow that stuff anyways. you You lost any privilege. You lost your damn freedom because you took somebody else's life. So you lost your privilege to get any letter or mail from some sicko that wants to go, oh, well, I thought he was pretty cute. Yeah, pretty cute till he suffocates you. 
Well, I never understood. I never understood that. I I, I never it's will. Losers. I never will. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we have Nicole Kessinger, who has apparently received so many death threats that it's been reported that she is being provided with federal protection and possibly maybe she might get a new identity. Well, and as like I said, as much as I don't like the Google searches, you know, uh, I, I do feel bad that she got mixed up in this. But again, you know, sometimes you pay for your actions. You, you, you pay for your decisions. Mm-hmm. And so think about this, you know, you, these people sometimes think it's just, you know, I'm at work. Here's this guy. He's married. Maybe he's separated. Maybe he's not. He's given me a little attention. I like that. Well, be careful for what you wish for, because something that you just think is good, that feeds your ego a little bit could wrap you up in a mess that you don't want to be involved in. Well, I take some satisfaction, Captain. In the I'm pissed f- off, man. I take some satisfaction in the fact that the the people that seem to, for whatever reason there is, and there's no good ones, admire Chris Watts. The individuals that want to harm him and cause him pain, they are the ones on the inside with him, and they are the ones closest to him. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from TNT and the new limited series, I Am the Night. This thrilling new true crime series stars Chris Pine and is inspired by the incredible true story of Fauna Hodel and Hollywood's most infamous unsolved murder, the Black Dahlia. Don't miss I Am the Night, Mondays at 9, 8 central, premiering January 28th on TNT. Go to IamTheNight.com for more. Make sure you check out all of our episodes, our old episodes on the Stitcher app. They're all for free from episode one to episode a million and forty five. That's right. We we that's <laughs> we, what we're on. We added another million. I, I love the Stitcher app. I recommend it to everybody. I'm not just saying that because we're on there. What I'm saying is mm-hmm. it's the only place to get all of the old episodes, the whole catalog for free. You and gotta you, check it out. You know what's really cool? What's that? I checked last night. We're number two on Stitcher in the whole world. That's because I just listen constantly so to our show. It's it's the beautiful, talented ladies of My Favorite Murder. Then it's Ooh. True Crime Garage. And then it's the the man, the myth, the legend, Joe Rogan. So we're in good company. We're But hey, we're, we're above Joe Rogan. We should have a pizza party with that group. That doesn't mean that we want to fight Joe Rogan. No. Let's make that clear, we're Joseph. Just, we want to make that clear, Joe. We're not we're not trying to fight you. But we want to thank everybody for so much support, so much love, and um and thanks for sharing on social media. And while we're doing the thank you thing here, Captain, I want to take a moment here to send out a big, big thank you. And this is because I was talking with somebody the other day. I was on the Lake Erie Murders episodes, mm-hmm. and somebody said, you know, that should make you feel really good about what you're doing. And I said to myself, it does, and thank you for that. However, what it really makes me feel good about and what points out to me, because this is one thing that I think is is a bit lost in this whole thing, where being asked to be on the show really only points to what somebody else that this network has deemed to be my credibility. And my credibility Straight up comes from you, Captain, from all your help and from everything you do for this show. I just sit here and say stupid things. Yeah, but you you are... get pissed off. You are a a larger-than-life reason that this whole show is what it is and that we've had so much fun doing this throughout these years. And because I supply the beer. Also, a big thank you to everyone out there who has given credibility to our show. And I also want to take a minute to recommend this week's recommended reading. Mm -hmm. Check out Woman at the Devil's Door, the untold story of the Hempstead Murderess. This is by Sarah Beth Hopton. So discover the haunting untold true story of the woman whose crimes inspired speculation that Jack the Ripper was a woman. 
And you can check mm. that out by going Wait, to Jack our... Jack the Ripper was a woman? Yes. There's well, there's some a... thoughts and theories about that. That's an interesting theory. You don't have to rewind and write down that title. You can go to truecrimegarage.com, click on the recommended page, and we have our recommended l- books there for you to check out. All right. I am, I'm going to... I want to be done being pissed off, so let's wrap this up so I can go drink some bourbon. Yeah, let's shut this down, and I'm going to have a beer. Thanks to everybody for joining us in the garage for this week's case. Join us again next week, and until then, be good, be kind, and don't you dare litter. Uh-huh.